Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This week on Know How, you're going to learn how to dual disc your MacBook and so doge, so mining. Wow. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, and for the next half hour, I'm going to break down some projects and give you the knowledge you need to geek out. Now, we're going to start with something from the chat room. We had quite a few people in our Google Plus page who wanted to see how they could take their old MacBook, this is a 2011, and maybe get a little more performance out of it. Specifically, they wanted to know how they could take out the optical drive, which has become all but useless in most iterations of operating systems, and replace it with another hard drive. We've seen this in laptops, especially on the PC side, especially on the desktop replacement side, but it's been problematic. The thing is, we like SSDs, like this one. This one's from Kingston. This is a 240 gigabyte. It's screaming fast, but if you're a professional, if you have a lot of stuff, if you have a lot of video clips, 240 gigabytes isn't a whole lot. Well, what if you could remove that useless optical drive from your MacBook and replace it with another hard drive? That could be the best of both worlds, an ultra-fast SSD and a super-large spinning hard drive. Let's show you how. But first, here are the things you're going to need. If you want to do this project, the first thing you have to find out is if your MacBook actually supports it. As I mentioned, this is a 2011 MacBook Pro. I was able to get one of these. This is a hard drive caddy for about seven bucks on eBay. You can find them from seven to $20. They're, they're really simple. If you notice, they look like an optical drive. This is actually the outline of an optical drive. You'll see it when we open it up. But on the other side, it has a slot so that I can put in a standard notebook SATA hard drive. The cool thing about this is that it's large enough, the, the optical bay, that you can use the larger, the, the higher format hard drives, which means you get your pick of the ultra high capacities. You could find a one terabyte, a 1.5 terabyte. This particular one is 500 gigabytes just for demonstration. You're gonna need a few other things. You're gonna need tools, but not that many. You need a jeweler screwdriver, something with a really fine Phillips head. You need a flathead screwdriver because you're gonna be doing a little bit of prying, and you need some sort of magnetic tool. I've had this one for 20 years. It's just a uh, multi-use screwdriver that has a magnet inside of it. You're gonna see why you're gonna need that when we open this up. Now, opening up your MacBook is not that hard. If you've got a unibody model, there are screws around the periphery of the MacBook. You simply remove those screws, and I've, I've actually pre-removed most of these, and uh, you can get at the innards. Now, this is one of the cool things about the, the Mac line, which is it's, it's actually quite easy to open up. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of doing. You just sort of remove and, and pry open. Once you've got all the screws off the back of your MacBook, like I do right now, this whole piece just comes right out. This is the inside of your Mac. We've got your processor, we've got the main board, you've got your battery, and right here is the optical drive. Optical drives are great, but they're not that useful right now because we do most of our stuff on the download. So why not get rid of that? What we need to do first, if we could zoom in right here, is we need to remove the cables that are keeping us from sliding out this optical drive. That's where you take your flat screwdriver and you gently, very gently and very carefully pry off the connector, one side then the other, and just pop them off like so. And that will get the, the uh, arrangement free. Now you're going to have to remove a set of five screws, three from the optical drive, and if you could back out, two from the speaker assembly that goes over the slot of the optical drive. That actually keeps it from coming out cleanly. So what I'm going to do is start with the assembly for the speakers. It's just two screws right here. Oh, one other thing to keep, keep in mind, when you're doing all this unscrewing, please, please keep your screws straight. You want to keep them in a pile so that you know which screws go where because they're not all the same size 
and if you put the wrong size screw back in, you're gonna strip the threads, and that's never a good thing. Now, down in these corners here, you're gonna find out that once I unscrew it, the screws tend to just kinda flop around. That's why you're gonna need your magnetic tool. Just reach down in there, and you'll be able to pick up those screws out of the crevice. Remember, there is no way easily to disconnect this battery, so you're gonna wanna make sure that these screws don't end up rattling around in the case where they could cause a short. There's one more screw right back here. If you just sort of flip back this cable, this one right here holds down the back of the drive. You can use my magnetic tool, pull it out. And now I've got a nice complete optical drive. Now this thing is still useful. If you do want to use an optical drive, you could buy for about $20 an enclosure that will turn this into a USB or Thunderbolt device, but most of us will probably just set it on a shelf and not really have to worry about it. I've now got this nice clean cavity and I'm ready to put this in, but first I need one piece from the optical drive. This little thing right here converts the SATA connector to the plug-in that's on the back of the motherboard. Again, using the flat, screw, uh, the flat screwdriver, just pry that off gently like so. And now I can take the part and go ahead and secure it onto the new caddy. If I wanted to, I could also pull the bracket off of the back of that optical drive and install it here so that my caddy has a three-point hold down. I'm kind of in a rush right now, but you could do that. I would actually suggest that you do that to give your installation more stability. Once I put that back in to the slot that I just took it out from, just making sure that I don't crimp any of the cables and it's nice and snug. You need this magnetic pad to put those little screws and, and on. See, and thanks to Leo Laporte, I now have a magnetic pad. Actually, this is a great idea. What you can do is take your screws and you put them in the quadrants. Actually, this is a great idea. So that it keeps them all separate and I don't have to worry about mixing my screws when I go to reinstall. Great idea, actually. Oh, it's, oh thank you, iFixit. All right, now, so we've got it back in the bay. I can take this cable and just go ahead and gently plug it back in. It might take a little bit of doing. Do not force this. If you break these connectors, that is a pain in the butt to replace. But you'll hear a little click. Let's see if I can get close enough. No, you won't hear it. And there we go. All right. Believe it or not, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave it open because, well, uh, you know, it's live TV. But I'm going to flip this over. But before I do, let me point out the fact that if I really, really wanted to get a lot of speed out of this upgrade, I would also, as long as I've got this open, I would replace the hard drive. Uh, we had an episode of Know How, you should go, ba go back and watch it, that showed you how to choose and install your SSD. If you really wanted to get the best out of your older MacBook, please try this. Go ahead and take out your rotating drive, put it in the caddy, and replace it with an SSD. It's a really good way to reuse your parts. But now that we've got this, I'm going to go ahead and turn the MacBook back on and hopefully I get power. Oh, good, it's booting, okay. While it's booting, come on back to my wide shot, let me explain a few things that you're gonna wanna look for. First of all, not all caddies are created equal. Make sure you get the one for your notebook, be it a MacBook, a PC, whatever it is. If you jump on eBay, you're gonna find a lot of them. Don't, don't immediately go for the cheapest ones. The cheapest ones are cheap for a reason. Some of them are so janky that you kind of have to bend them and force them to get them in. That's, that's never, ever a good thing. The other thing to remember about these is, especially the less expensive ones, they're not designed to be put in, taken out, put in, taken out. That really wears out the connectors. It's a good way to make sure that you, you kill a drive at the most inopportune time. But now that I'm into my screen, I'm almost booted up. I'll just go down to my finder and the cool thing is, oh, quit. Thank you. Go away. And if you look at my, oh, actually, can you get in there? If you look at the finder right here, you'll see that it has a new drive called Untitled. And that's a 500 gigabyte drive. That's the drive that we just put in there. It's really that simple. I mean, you may have to initialize if you've got something else on the drive or if it's brand new. But the cool thing about something like this is I've just taken a piece out of my notebook that I wasn't using and I've added a lot of extra capacity, essentially giving myself a brand new notebook, especially if I upgrade it 
to an SSD. Now this is one of the easiest hacks that you could do of an older MacBook and it's nice that it has that kind of a drive bay. Unfortunately many of the new Mac Pros don't have that that optical drive. None of the brand new ones do. But there is a hack that we're going to show you in a while that will show you how to double up your drives and get the same kind of performance. Now let's move on in the show. There are a lot of people who have been acting asking about cryptocurrency. Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Litecoin. So I thought we should have a know-it-all to tell you all the news about the crypto. If you've been keeping your ear to the internet, you've probably heard the term cryptocurrency, but you may not know exactly what it means. Let me break it down for you. The cryptocurrency you've probably heard about is Bitcoin. It's the most popular and it is the one with the highest value. I believe at some point the value hit something like $1,500. It was the very first, 2009, and it uh, well, was popular because a lot of people got into it and they poured their resources into it, and that's really what determines the value of a cryptocurrency. But how does it work? Well, quite simply, a cryptocurrency has a few commonalities, no matter what cryptocurrency you're talking about. The first is that it's decentralized as opposed to a fiat currency, which has a government backing it, some sort of entity that controls it, there is no one who controls a cryptocurrency. It's designed to be that way. You own your cryptocurrency, you get to do what you want to do with your cryptocurrency, and there is no central server that keeps tabs of how much you have or what you're doing with it. Again, that's kind of alluring. The second commonality is that it is encrypted. Now, I'm not talking about adding a layer of encryption on top of the data. I mean, it's actually baked in to the digital DNA of every cryptocurrency. The currency units themselves, the transactions, everything you do with a piece of cryptocurrency is encrypted. And it's designed to be that way so that, well, you can get a bit of your, your privacy back. Now, going beyond that, the cryptocurrencies diverge. There's a few dozen of them right now, but they all more or less work the same way. They start with what's called a blockchain. You, you're going to hear about this if you ever want to mine a cryptocurrency rather than just purchasing it and trading it. Now, when we mine for cryptocurrencies, what it means is that we're using the power of a computer or a specialized device to get that chain of letters and numbers that will prove that we have unlocked a block. Now, that proof will go to a server and it will reward us with the value of that block, whatever it may be. Now that value will differ from currency to currency because there are certain rules. These currencies all state at the beginning, when, before anyone starts mining, exactly how many mining units there are going to be. For example, for Bitcoin, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. Ever. You can't print more, you can't change the rules, you can't say, no, 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 we want to double it. There will only be 21 million for all times. Now, you can divide that almost infinitely. You can have a, a, a section, a fraction, a tiny piece of a Bitcoin, and it will be worth whatever that fraction is. Now, other cryptocurrencies, like for example, Litecoin has 84 million and Dogecoin has a hundred billion, well, they'll play with the level of encryption and they'll play with the reward and they'll play with the total number of units in order to entice people to mine their currency because, again, that establishes the value. Now, let's take a look at one other thing, and that's, that's the mining aspect because I, I think that's probably the one you've heard about, people turning on their laptops and their desktops and priming for hours to find the proof that they should be rewarded with that blockchain. Well, in the early days, you could mine for Bitcoin. In fact, I mined for Bitcoin with a laptop not unlike this way back in the day. And I, and I got, I think, the first one within about 12 minutes or so. Not bad. But if I were to do that today, it would be priming for years and years and years and would probably still never get me a Bitcoin. You see, that's another thing that is common in many of these cryptocurrencies and that is that it gets progressively more difficult to unlock each successive block in the chain. That's, that's on purpose. It rewards people who got in early. But it also means that you can no longer use a computer like this, a general purpose computer, to mine something like a Bitcoin, which is based on SHA-256. Instead, you need to use specialized ASICs, these pieces of silicon that just crunch numbers in order to do it. And even then, the, the return rate has greatly decreased. Now, what we have also seen is the rise of other altcoins, alt currencies, cryptocurrencies, something like Litecoin or Dogecoin, which are not based on SHA, 
but which are based on script. Now, script, it was designed specifically to resist the attempts to make ASICs to mine them. It's a slightly different type of hashing algorithm because it requires memory in order to find that chain of letters and numbers that will unlock it. That means that you can't make a customized customize ASIC, but rather you have to use some of these monster GPUs. Now, it is a fun, fun world, but there are all sorts of reasons that you should be wary before you get involved in cryptocurrency. What I would suggest is you drop by some of the websites for Dogecoin and Bitcoin and Litecoin and just read up from the, the user experiences to find out if it's something that you want to do with your time. But until then, happy mining. Happy mining indeed. Now, I didn't just want to give you the theoretical, I actually want to show you how you could use your setup to go ahead and get some Dogecoin. Oh, now let's 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 be really clear. First of all, the reason why I'm not showing you Bitcoin or Litecoin is because the difficulty on those currencies is already too high. It would take forever for you to mine them with the rig you have, unless you have a custom gear rig. Now we're going to show you how to make that later on, but I wanted to give you something that was a bit of fun. Another disclaimer: This is an entirely speculative currency. Don't expect to make any money. In fact. We're looking at here in the Twit Brickhouse as something that's kind of fun. It's a competition to see how many doge each of us can mine, and uh, we've been building rigs in order to mine it the quickest. At some point, the currency could be worth something because there's nothing that separates Dogecoin from Bitcoin or Litecoin. It is a actual cryptocurrency, but keep in mind that you're probably not going to strike it rich, and if you do, you should probably pay Brian and Snubs and myself. All right, let's get to the learning. Really quickly, you're going to need two sets of downloads from the internet. The first one is from the Dogecoin website. If Brian, if you could switch over to my laptop right now, just go to Doge, dogecoin.com and right here, it will allow you to pick your operating system, be it Windows or OS 10 or a browser. Please don't use a browser. Please use either Windows or OS 10. And when you do that, it will let you download a wallet. Now, this is what a wallet does. It looks something like this. This is a Dogecoin wallet, a brand spanking new Dogecoin wallet. What a Dogecoin wallet does is exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to keep your Dogecoins. When you get rewarded, either out of a pool or a solo mine with some of these units, those strings that identify it, that, that show that it belongs to you, will be kept inside this wallet. This wallet will also let you do transactions, either receiving them from people if, if they, you know, they, you, they're paying you off, or to transact it to somebody else. Let's say I wanted to send Brian 100,000 Doge. This is where I would do it. But the one that you want to do at the first is much receive. If you click this, you'll see that you have these addresses. These addresses are unique to you. They only exist on this computer. They only exist in this particular installation. This is important because you may have heard that Dogecoin was hacked. Dogecoin was not hacked. What was hacked was Doge Wallet, which is an online wallet for coins. Please don't ever put your coins online because they'll they'll get stolen. That's that's what happens. Once you have this unique address, you can go ahead and join a pool. Now, the reason why we want to join a pool is because let's go back to the difficulty of, of mining again. If you try to do it by yourself, especially for these cryptocurrencies that have been established, it will take you forever. It's it's just too long of a process now to really be practical and uh, well just don't do it. You want to join a pool because what that does is it splits off the risk. When you're mining by yourself, there's a chance that you could get a huge payout, millions and millions of Dogecoin at the very beginning, but it's far more likely that you'll go for years without ever getting anything. This is the pool that many people in the Twit Brick House have joined. This is the Doge House. Now, what makes this a good, uh, a, a good pool to join is that they, they're always up. You want a pool that has a really good uptime and that has a lot of workers. And actually, if I go to my dashboard here, it shows you that right now they've got 6,000 workers who are currently mining. It shows that my hash rate is about 489, and it shows that our overall hash rate is 3.26 giga hashes. The higher that hash rate, the more possibility that that pool will stumble upon blocks. And then those blocks get divided to people depending on how many resources they put into the pool. Now, okay, this is, this is cool to look at, but we don't need this. What we need is this right here. If I go to my workers, 
it shows me how many computers or how many accounts I currently have active. The one at the top is my personal computer. That's the one that does all my video producing. It has a decent graphics card, so it's producing at 387 kilohash a second. Now, I want to create a new worker for every computer I'm using, just so I know exactly how much they're producing. And that process is very easy. I could put, say, know how. My worker is KH1. And my password is KH1. Actually, not M Yeah. Boom. What I've just done is I've created a brand new worker that's called Padre SJ period KH1 with a password of KH1. Now, the reason why I feel comfortable giving you the password is because the only thing you could do with that, if you wanted to mess with me, is you could put one of your workers and set it to give me Dogecoin. So please do that, padre.kh1, password. KH1. All right, now we've got that. We've got our wallet set up. We've got our pool set up. We've got our worker set up. Let's go mining. You cut back out to the wide shot, Brian. This is a no-name humdrum system. This is pretty much what most of you are going to find on your desktop if, if you're not a gamer, if you're not an elite video editor. Probably decent specs. This one has 8 gigabytes of memory. It has a small hard drive. Not too big of a power supply, has a, an okay, a middling video card. Uh, but the video card here is actually not good enough to, to mine Bitcoin. So what we're going to do is show you the lowest common denominator right here. This is the second download you need. You need to get CG Miner. But this is CG Miner. It's a Litecoin miner that's made for script. As I explained in the theoretical section, script is different than Bitcoin, uh, SHA-256, because it specifically requires a lot of memory. It, it's, it's more resistant to ASICs. Because I don't have a fancy GPU on this, I'm going to have to mine, if you could zo zoom in here, I'm going to have to mine with the CPU instead. Now, this looks a little daunting, but what you want to do is you want to go to the mine with CPU.bat. We're going to go ahead and edit that file. And now if you look at the string, which I've already pre-coded for a different wallet, this is just the command to go ahead and tell the, GPU, the CPU to mine, to send it to the pool at dogehouse.org at port 3333 at the account knowhow.kh1 and the password kh1. Very, very simple. When I click this, it's going to start hashing. It, wait, it's, gonna, it's looking for the, ah, there we go. It just talked to the pool. It got the hash that it needs to work on, and it's, it's going ahead and started to hash. Now, if you look, the hash rate is pitifully low. This is crazy, crazy. But this is pretty much what you're going to get. If you're using CPU, look for a hash rate between 7 and 21. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter how fast you think your CPU is. CPUs are just not that good at hashing. But this is what you can get. I mean, this will run on every notebook. This will run on every desktop. This will run on pretty much anything that's running Windows or OS X or even Linux for you elite ninja, no, Linux ninjas. What we're, what we're doing now is this is contributing to the Dogecoin pool that I've already created on dogehouse.org. The cool thing about this is I could, say, run this very lightweight program on all the computers here at Twit, and they would all be pumping Doge into my wallet. So rich, very padre. Wow. Now, this, this is just the beginning. The reason why we started you off with this is because I want you, before the next episode, to be able to go back to your computer, on your gaming machine, in your spare time, whenever you're not using, and go ahead and start up the CPU miner. Get used to it because, believe it or not, that command line is going to be more important than anything else you do. What we'll be explaining in the next episode of Know How when we go on to upgrading your computer to be able to do much faster mining. Remember, the, the one I have at home has, what, 387 kilohash versus 5 kilohash for this. We're going to show you what you tweak in order to get the most out of your system. Now, until that time, take this homework, take our show notes, Go and download a wallet, go and download a Dogecoin miner, and get barking. Now, if you want to know more about all the products, projects that we did, if you want to know, learn how to dual disk your MacBook, if you want to learn how to go crazy with Dogecoin, you got to stop by our show notes. We do have the best show notes in the business. You can find us at twit.tv slash kh. And you'll see the show notes for each and every single episode. It's especially important for this episode because I'm going to give you the links where you get to download the software that we just talked about. Also, did you know that we have a Google Plus community, community page at gplus.to slash kh? The cool thing about that community page is I pull ideas for future episodes out of our Google Plus community. In fact, 
That's where the dual disc MacBook came from. Go ahead and drop on over, say hi, and maybe even make a suggestion about what you would like to see on a future episode of Know How. We can't always get to every suggestion right away, but I promise if it's liked enough, if we can possibly do it, we'll do it. Also, did you know that you can email me? That's right. Go ahead and email me at knowhow at twit.tv, and uh, I'll try to get back to you. What we can do there is uh, we can figure out if maybe you have a project, or maybe you can be a guest on a future edition of Know How. It's, and again, one of the things that we try to do in this experimental wonderment that we call Twit. Finally, please write us on Twitter. You can find me at PadreSJ. You can find Snubs at, at Snubs. And you can find Brian. Brian. Where are you on Twitter? I forget. I am cranky underscore hippo. Cranky? Oh, by the way, I, I wanted to ask you this. Mm -hmm. You mind Doge? Oh, I mind Doge. Really? Yeah, yeah, well, me and Alex have been having that competition. So, so uh, how many Doge do you have right now? Uh, uh, how many does Alex have? I'm kind of afraid to say. I think it's close to 40,000. Oh, mm -hmm. good. I have 60,000 then, now, so I'm let, beating let, Alex. Let me ask you this. Cranky Hippo, if I were to have an episode, a super advanced episode, towards the end of my Dogecoin time, where I showed people how to build a pool, and we actually had a Dogecoin pool here at Twit, would you be willing to start fresh and not cheat and compete with the rest of Chat Realm to see who could be the king of the Doge? I, I think I'd be up for that. I'd give it a shot. I see Jammer B behind you, too. I, I believe he's he's also gotten into the Doge spirit, yes? John John's a Doger, too. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, well, you've heard it here, and if Cranky Hippo says it, it must be true. Mm -hmm. We're going to be building a way for you to compete against the rest of the Twitch staff to find out who the big Doge is. Now, on a personal note, I, I do want to take some time to mentioned that yes we we have lost Ayaz Akhtar. He has gone over to CNET. He's taken a very good job and I respect him for making a decision that was important for him, for him, for his career and for his family. We wish him all the best and I know that a lot of you were with him from the very beginning of Know How from episode one. We could never replace that work but what we can do is we can honor him by making the best dang Know How we possibly can. I'm Father Robert Ballester and now that you know Go do it.